Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Wednesday at 1. I'm glad you're with me this afternoon. Uh, we're going to have some fun with, uh, with the Christmas story. Uh, some of you have probably been with me when I've done this before, but I know there are some who have not had the opportunity to think through um, how the different Gospels report the uh, the story of Jesus. Hello, Pam Kerr. How are you? Good to see you on board. And as I say, this may be a repeat for some of you, but um, as I learn more and more about the gospel authors and their audiences, I learn more and more about what to see and what to look for uh, when I'm reading or when I'm hearing stories from the gospel writers. So I'm hoping that um, this isn't all a retread for, for some of you, uh, or if it is, maybe uh, you'll catch something, something more this time than you did the last time you heard it. Um, good afternoon, Lloyd and Peggy. It's good to see you all back. I've missed you. I missed you last week. I was not having as much fun as I am having today last week, so thank you for your prayers. Uh, I'm all healed up and ready to rock and roll tomorrow evening for uh, for Christmas Eve, so we're getting ready to go. And uh, So um, let's start with a moment of prayer. Why don't you take a deep breath, just kind of settle yourself, settle yourself, kind of go inside yourself. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time together and time that we will spend in your word, once again reminding ourselves of the wonderful story that you have caused to be written and to come down over the many, many generations, uh, both in song and in artwork and uh, in the descriptions that come from your holy word. We thank you so much for all of the storytellers in our lives, for all of ways that the story comes to us, uh, that we participate in Christmas. We thank you for this time together. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me silence my phone so we don't get binging going on. No binging during Wednesdays at 1. Hello, David Swanson. Welcome aboard. We have a new member with us today, David Swanson. Uh, he and his wife just joined, he have returned to the area, and uh, formerly members of Salem, and now they are coming to be among us. So, David, thank you for being with us. And there's Brenda. So, oh, now Brenda's here, we can start. <laughs> so, thank you for praying with me. And uh, let's just do a little bit of review to make sure that everybody starts in the same place. Uh, for those of you who have worked with me before, you can probably pretty much tell me uh, which gospel was first and all of that kind of stuff, but let me just review that real briefly. Most scholars at this point um, would agree that Mark was the first gospel that was written down, probably early, um, or sorry, late in the 70s, 70 AD, which would be would have been 40 or 50 years beyond when Jesus went back to heaven. So we've got a whole, at least one whole generation uh, of people who have passed the story down uh, until it is written. So the first written gospel, probably around 70, 75, um, there's a lot of scholarship going on around whether it happened before or after the destruction of the temple. But um, Rome's thumb was squarely on the people um, of Judea and uh, so that occupation and persecution was at a height during the time that Mark was writing his gospel. It was very brief, the most brief of all the gospels. Uh, its audience was Jewish Christians or Jews who had followed Jesus. So they were Christ-believing Jews, um, not yet at the point where they started to um, identify themselves as Christian but um, definitely those who were followers of Jesus. So that would, that would be Mark. Then we have Luke and Matthew writing probably late in the 80s, um, maybe even as late as 90 now, but usually um, scholars will place them about 85 to 90, and probably writing contemporaneously. The cool thing about Matthew and Luke, Matthew was... Um, and again, reminding you that these authors were not actual per persons, that here's a person who's writing, like Paul's letters. 
the Gospels were probably group efforts, schools of people who had taken on the task of sharing the story and gathering information, especially when they got to the point where it was not clear uh, if Jesus was going to return during their lifetime. So everybody, you know, as that first generation of disciples and those who had walked with Jesus started to pass on, um, it became much more um, an immediate task for them to get the story written down. So that's that's what happened in Mark. And then uh, t 10 years later or so, um, now we have two other writers, two other communities that are, are needing to have the story told. Again, maybe with a little more detail, they may have had more detail had been uncovered, um, or other witnesses who were willing to share their story and their experience. So Luke and Matthew writing about the same time. Matthew, um, for a Jewish audience, again, Christ-believing Jews, but very important to keep the Jewish heritage and the connection to Jesus as Messiah that the Jews had expected. Um, whereas Luke was um, often thought to be the physician who traveled with Paul, uh, who was a Gentile Christian, um, and also writing for a community of Gentile Christians. So we have a, a Jewish perspective and a Christian perspective or a Gentile perspective and these two writers writing about the same time. Um, and then of course, and those three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what we call the synoptic gospels because they write in a narrative, historically linear form um, and are very similar. They, they share some information um, there is some that is in all three, some that's only in one or another, um, and so, but they were writing within a 15 to 20 year period. Much later, uh, Mark, if Mark was around 70, then much later into the 90s, um, we have the Gospel of John, which is a completely different genre of gospel. It is written from the perspective of faith um, and not just to tell the details of the story. Um, and John was is thought to have been either John the Apostle, so as in James and John, or um, people who had been with him, so disciples of John. But uh, a good part of John's writing uh, seems to be eyewitness account, and, uh, and so a lot of that is it comes from John. And, and it is interesting enough that there are a lot of things that, that John does not include or includes in a completely different way, um, whereas Matthew, Mark, and Luke are really seem to be kind of trying to tell the story in the best way that they can uh, for the community that they're writing for. So Mark first, and then Matthew and Luke about the same time, maybe 10, 15 years after Mark, so that would have been um, almost two generations after Jesus walked on the earth. So we're moving further and further away from people who actually were with him. I don't think it was ever intended that these Gospels be eyewitness accounts. This is not like three different news articles about an event. Um, these are statements of faith. These are um, things that is where stories are told through different lenses, different perspectives for different audiences. I often use the example of um, Pastor Antone and I might be preaching on the same text. Uh, we might have the same story, and you know from hearing us both preach that we would never in a million years um, probably preach the same way. We would not we would not highlight the same points. We would not focus on the same themes. Uh, just our experience causes us to interact with a story differently. Um, I'm female, he's male, I'm white, he's black, he's from Africa, I'm from here. You know, there are so many things about the person who is telling the story from the resource um, and for a particular audience that causes those things to change and to be interpreted. So these were never intended to be literal, um, word-for-word -word reporting accounts of the story of Jesus. So keep that in mind, which will help what we're going to do uh, a little bit more. So it may surprise you to know, or not, that Mark has no Christmas story. Okay, there is no story about the beginning of Jesus. Um, Mark begins with, and let me just read chapter 1-1. 
the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the path of the Lord, make his way straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness. Okay, so we start in Mark's gospel with the advent of the coming of Jesus being prophesied and expected, but the first mention uh, comes in the context of the one who is his forerunner, his preparer, and that is John the Baptist. So there's no infancy, what we call an infancy narrative. There are no stories of Jesus as a young boy. There are no stories of his birth um, or time in the temple as a young, young man. He will appear at the Jordan in front of John to be baptized as a fully grown man at age 30, 31. Um, so we have no record in Mark about that. Now, that would be because for Mark's audience, the most important thing for them is the entry into the community. And so we have not only the baptismal narratives where we talk about Jesus, who we know is the Son of God and has come. Um, the first thing that he does to start his ministry is to go through this transformative uh, sacramental action that we have used for years and centuries in the church to enter into the community of God's kingdom and the people of God. as And so that was what was important for Mark's people who were being persecuted by Rome, who needed another community, who needed another way to be in the world. And, uh, and so that's how Mark chooses to begin his narrative. The other gospel that does not have an infancy narrative is the gospel of John. And yet we have in that a very familiar passage, which actually we will hear uh, on Christmas Eve as before we light the candles at the end of the service, the, the incarnation narrative from John, which is absolutely beautiful, probably was a hymn uh, early on in worship times in, in John's community. Um, but this sets the coming of Jesus in the cosmic setting. This is not about a baby being born in Bethlehem. This is about the whole cosmos giving form to a human expression of God. Um, so we go from, you know, one of everything down to the particular, from the divine to the human, from the, you know, the, the whole um, universe is birthing this human, this enfleshed, form of God. And you all know this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God. And then it goes on and on and on, and the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. Nothing about a baby, nothing about Bethlehem. So two of the four accounts that we depend upon to know about Jesus don't tell us anything about how and where He was born. Okay, so we're going to we're going to focus today basically on the two gospels that do have the infancy accounts. And um, there is a lot of scholarship and a lot of um, intentional commentary about why Matthew and Luke would find it important to go back to the beginning. Both Matthew and Luke were rooted in genealogical study using that genealogy as an identifier for who Jesus was. Um, so when we get to the place where um, we have Jesus on the scene and most of the backlash against him and his teaching will come about the authority issue. Who gave you this authority? How are you doing these things? Why are you doing these things? What gives you the right? To have this kind of authority. And so both Matthew and Luke are going to go back to the genealogies to talk about where this person came from, his lineage, and how that lines up with the expectation of the coming of Messiah. Luke is very clear that Jesus is the Messiah from the very beginning of this letter that he writes to um, a patron, uh, Theophilus, and Matthew is the same in that he starts to and goes through, you know, all the way back to Adam to make sure that people know that this is the one that they are, that they have been waiting for, the long-awaited Messiah. 
Um, Mark and John don't seem to be so concerned about that, but apparently in the time that Matthew and Luke are writing, um, to give these credentials uh, was, was important to both the Jewish Christians and to the Gentile Christians. Could have been because of the influence of the Gentile Christians, um, who were not quite so steeped in the tribal issues of the Hebraic world, um, where tribes gave you identity, where tribes were so important, and the Gentiles um, didn't live in that kind of community. So part of this is to, um, to try to um, bring the Gentiles on board as far as how important this was as to who Jesus was uh, as a Jewish man. Um, and in that conversation back and forth about why is this so important to Jews, um, perhaps because the Gentiles didn't know, because the Gentiles didn't accept that it wasn't part of the way they thought about people and how people appeared with their issues and their identity. And so because of that, it became important for those ground rules and those, um, those uh, resume builders to be presented within the beginning of the story of this one who had come. So one of the things I always do, and especially with younger groups of people, um, is I always ask them to describe their manger scene, their nativity scene, or creche, whatever you call it. And of course, they'll always talk, you know, there's Mary and Joseph, and there's animals, and there's Jesus in the, in the straw, and then there's shepherds, and there's angels, and there's wise men, and you know, you kind of go through the whole thing, got camels, you got a couple, you know, some people have, you know, extremely ornate manger scenes that have come down through the generations. But it is so funny to me that always, um, I like to have two separate manger scenes set up, especially for confirmation and say, over here we have Luke's manger scene, and over here we have Matthew's manger scene. And in Luke's manger scene, we have angels and shepherds, and Mary and Joseph and the baby, and they're in a stable in Bethlehem. Um, in Matthew's gospel, there are no shepherds, there are no angels um, at the birth, but there are wise men. No wise men in Luke, no angels and shepherds in Matthew. So why would that be? Why would these things that these supernatural powers, these uh, these heavenly hosts, these this this way that God and um, and the power of the divine interact with the mortal, why would those things not come uh, in Matthew, who you would think would be the one who would be delighted to have? Uh, God so involved in how this story unfolds. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna take a look at some of those things. Just a reminder now, you can let go all of, of all that stuff about Mark and John now, just set that aside because we're gonna, not going to talk about them anymore. We're going to talk about Luke and we're going to talk about Matthew. Matthew, let me remind you, was um, writing for a Jewish audience. Luke, writing for a Gentile audience. So Matthew's themes were themes, not surprisingly, Hebraic. Um, they were themes of righteousness. The law was important. Prophecy was important. For those of you who had um, been around the table at church for Wednesdays at 1 previously, you probably got my little four-sided um, bookmark that says, you know, Matthew, here's Matthew's themes and things to look for in Matthew, and here's Luke and Luke's themes and things to look for in Luke. You will see as you as we read through part of this story, if you have that little bookmark and you can open it to Luke and Matthew uh, facing one another, you will see um, Matthew's, all of Matthew's themes have to do with fulfillment of prophecy, righteousness under the law, living in community, that Jesus was the one who fulfilled all of the obligations, that the Messiah and the uh, the anticipation of the Messiah is very clearly there, that there are codes and purity laws and um, rituals in Matthew that just don't appear in Luke, or if they do appear in Luke, there's an explanation as to why this is done. This was done to fulfill the word of the prophet Isaiah. This was done, uh, you know, because that's what Jews did. You know, so in Luke, there's a lot of explanation of things 
as they appear, especially if there is a description of something that would have been considered a Jewish ritual that maybe had not made its way into the Christ-believing Jew Jews community. So they are still rooted in the law, rooted in Jewish custom and ritual, and although some of those things will eventually make their way into the, the more, you know, substantially Christian expression of religious community, they haven't probably yet done so. So we've got those two pictures of, you know, this is, um, this is the birth of Jesus the Messiah from the perspective of a Jew, and this is the birth of Jesus the Messiah from the perspective of the rest of the world who were non-Jewish, who were Gentile. So as we look at Luke and we see the large, very long involved story of the preliminaries of, of what happened. I mean, we don't get to Jesus until the second chapter of Luke. So we have an entire chapter uh, that goes, which prepares the way. We have the story of Zechariah and his wife, Elizabeth. We see these miraculous events going on in Luke um, that we that we hear about all these different things that are going to be unfolding. Excuse me, let me back up a little bit um, and just kind of review that. First of all, we have, um, you know, this is a letter to Theophilus, who, which in Greek literally means lover of God. So that could have been a person, a patron, or it could have just been kind of a cover that this letter is going to anyone who is a lover of God. And so it's kind of a, a covert message. But we start out in Judea um, with a priest named Zechariah. And we talk about who he, you know, how he was serving in the temple and so on and so forth. And that he and his wife Elizabeth were barren. And then he finds out because he prays when he goes into the temple to do his work. Uh, which is a rotating task that he will perform, um, that the angel Gabriel appears to him and tells him that his wife Elizabeth is going to have a child. And of course, this is John the Baptist that she's going to have. So um, along with that and that going on over here in, in, you know, in the countryside, we find out that not only is Elizabeth miraculously going to have a child in her barren old age, but her young, young kinswoman, Mary, who is just newly engaged, contracted, betrothed to uh, Joseph, has also been visited by an angel. And this angel has told her that she will conceive and bear a son. And this one will be called Jesus and he will be the savior of the world. So Mary, you know, <laughs> okay, whatever, you know, um, it's probably a good thing she was a young woman because an older woman might have said, what are you, nuts? <laughs> you know, but um, she goes along with what the angel Gabriel shares with her and in haste goes because the angel has shared that her, um, her kinswoman Elizabeth is also with child and she's about six months along. So Mary sets out right away to go and speak with Elizabeth. I mean, there's no phoning, no texting. She has to go to talk to her and spend some time with Elizabeth. Then, we, you know, we have this encounter between Mary and Elizabeth where the baby in Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy uh, just upon the sight of Mary. And so John and Jesus meet um, even before they have been born. There is a connection between them. So then we have John the Baptist is born, and all of this part of the story is preliminary to the introduction of Jesus and what happens around his birth. But we've already set it into a kind of a miracle working setting. And in that miracle working sen setting, um, Luke is much more interested in um, universal um, acceptance of Jesus. He is beyond just the, the Jews as the chosen people. It's obvious that God has moved the church out um, away from the Christ-believing Jews and into the Gentile community. So Luke is much more interested in finding ways to make Jesus much more 
acceptable to those who do not have a Jewish background, knowing that the story will unfold at the further and further away that Christianity moves from its original root in Judaism. So Luke is very careful about setting the stage with these miracles that are going to draw people of any faith, um, that there's miracles in hand, that God is moving and working in this story. Okay, And then we come to the point where we hear the story that we'll hear again tomorrow evening, uh, the very famous Christmas story that you always hear on Christmas Eve, and that is from chapter 2. So I'm going to read just a little bit. In those days... A decree went out from the Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea because to, to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and the family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them at the inn. Okay, um, so what we have learned in this first paragraph in the second chapter is that there is a historical setting for this birth uh, that would have been more important for people who were not convinced that a tribal connection brought you the identity to do what Jesus was going to be doing. So they set it historically so people would know exactly when this was taking place in those days. When the decree came out from Caesar Augustus, which everyone would have remembered because this was the first time there was a registration or a census, the first time that Rome had asked to count the people and cause them all to go back to the places where they were born. It was also under the rule when, gov when Quirinius was governor of Syria. So we have two um, elected or two officials, two leaders of, of the, um, you know, of the countryside that are named here that are historical leaders. So this is rooted in, in historical context in a time. And Mary and Joseph come from Nazareth to Bethlehem because why? Because Joseph was from the house of David. So he was a descendant of the king. Now, that would have been very impressive for the Jews that David, that uh, King David um, descendant, Joseph, was the, one of the centerpieces of this story. Um, but later we also find in the genealogies later that Mary was also of the house and lineage of David. So um, in a different, in a different way. So they both have credentials, but you know, in the Gentile world, um, as in the Jewish world, men would have been um, the way that people got their identity and their authority. So the names and the and the lineage of David were of uh, Joseph were important. And he goes to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. Now, if all we had was Luke, we would say, "Huh, wonder how that happened." They are engaged not yet married, and she is expecting a child. And he is taking her to his homeland, you know, um, and there doesn't seem to be any problem with the fact that she's carrying a child. Now, Joseph has had no visitation from an angel. Joseph only has the word of Mary. Um, and this other story about this miraculous conception for um, John the Baptist but we don't know anything here about how Joseph felt about this, except that he brings her along uh, because she's pregnant. And when they get there, which is also the time where she's to give birth to her firstborn child, uh, there's no place for them to stay. Um, so obviously he has descended many generations away from David because he can't even get himself a room in Bethlehem, which is the city of David. So um, his credentials didn't work very well. Um, but they, 
they go to a stable or a place where animals had been kept because there was a manger or a feeding trough where she put Jesus after wrapping him in swaddling clothes. So <clears throat> there, there's, you know, this is where it's very interesting. You have to take each gospel story by itself without the other information that we get from the other gospel writers to try to find out really what is the trajectory and what is the focus here. So I'm going to pick up and read just a little more. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favored. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they were made known what they had been told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these things in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Now here's an interesting turn. Here we have this amazing event that's happening that's going to start the story of Jesus of Nazareth, who is the Messiah, the Lord. So you see that here, because Luke is telling the story, he can't just stop and say he is the Messiah because there would be people who didn't know what that meant. So he adds to the title, who is the Messiah, the Lord, and he makes great pains to talk about this being a savior. Okay, this is a savior. Um, the Jews would have known that the word Messiah meant savior, meant anointed one, and their expectation was that this would be the new David who would come and throw off the enemies and bring about the glory days that they remembered from when David was king. But the fact that this message of this amazing person who has just been born comes first to shepherds is a very intriguing piece. And it is so Luke to tell the story in this way. Luke is always very um, favorable to women. He lifts up women in the stories. He loves the supernatural and the miraculous. So we have this miraculous story. Uh, we have angels, divine creatures, messengers from God, and they come not to kings and princes and people of value and wealth and authority, but to shepherds. These are guys who would not even been heard in court. They were nomads. They had nothing and usually were kind of the scum of the earth. So here we have this amazing news coming from heavenly creatures to shepherds, telling them to go and check it out. Go to Bethlehem. This is what you're going to find there. But what we're telling you that this is um, the Messiah, the Lord, and this is good news for all the people. As a Gentile, you would want to know that God's message was for you, not just for the chosen ones of Israel, but for everyone. So in the mouths of the angels, we get this indication over and over again that this good news is for all those on the earth. Great joy for all the people. Panta to ethnos, all the peoples in Greek, all the peoples of the earth. Um, so it's not just from the chosen ones. And so the shepherds come to Bethlehem and find Mary and Joseph and the baby. And when they see it, they tell what they have experienced. 
and Mary believes them immediately, which is, you know, kind of what she's about. She hears the angel and believes him immediately and just goes about pondering things in her heart. And then the shepherds return, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Now, if you've been with me for a while, I will tell you this is an echo. Okay, this is going to be an echo that we're going to hear again at the tomb on Easter morning. Only this time it will be that other group that nobody ever listens to. It will be women. They also, upon seeing a heavenly messenger called an angel, will be terrified. And then the message will be brought forth to those um, many generations because the women will go and tell the story. So we have shepherds and women encountering angels who have messages of great joy that will affect all the world. And the two least believed witnesses are the ones to whom God comes. The chosen ones have become the humble ones, the ones who have never had status and never had anything that anyone would believe. So there's an interesting twist um, for a Gentile audience. They are the ones who have not had the, the responsibility of a religious experience or a religious story. They had many, many gods. They had many, many religious experiences. But to be part of the monotheistic God's story was something new in history. And so the Gentile Christians were being brought into the story in a way that made them feel just as special as though those who had been telling um, the foretelling the story of Jesus for generations, the Jews. So that's uh, a little bit on Luke. Now I want to take the remainder of the time and move back over to Matthew. Uh, and in Matthew, again, we really get the birth of Jesus at the very end of the first chapter. Um, we ha start with the genealogy once again, only in this genealogy, if you ever want to compare the genealogies, that's a kind of a fun thing to do and see who appears and who doesn't appear as you go along, uh, along the road. Um, Matthew has uh, basically the introduction of Jesus and his birth at the end of the first chapter. We've had the genealogy. We have had... Um, Basically, this is how we got from, you know, from Abraham all the way down to, to the Messiah. And this is all about the Messiah. Let me read just the very first um, one, one of Matthew says, This is an account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So, you know, there's no doubt who we're going to be talking about. There's no doubt that Matthew and Matthew's people believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. So we just jump right into the story and how he began. So this is 1.18. Uh, now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from the sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relationships with her until she had borne a son and they named him Jesus. Okay, so that's basically the birth story, um, and it really focuses on Joseph. So I like to say that Luke, the telling of the story in Luke, is from the perspective of Mary. So we have much more about Mary and her relatives and what was going on with her 
with Zechariah, with Elizabeth, with John the Baptist. Um, it's all from Mary's point of view. And that was unusual. It would have been unusual had it been done by Matthew because Matthew was a Jew and the story always revolved around the men and how that works. So it focuses on Joseph. Joseph finds Mary to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. How do we know that? We don't have the visitation between Gabriel and Mary. We don't have any of her story except for how Joseph understood it. Uh, and it isn't until he's ready to dismiss her quietly, which is he was a generous and respected man uh, and wanted to keep her from public disgrace, that he has a visitation by an angel in a dream. And this, again, is kind of unusual for Matthew that he would have a visitation by an angel uh, in a dream. Uh, but that Matthew is rooted in the, in the Hebrew scriptures where we have you know, Jacob and, and we have Abraham and we have all kinds of people talking to God, talking to messengers of God, you know, so that in itself is not unusual. It's only when we juxtapose it with, with Luke's story that we have those things um, where we're going, you know, Luke is talking about all this magical, supernatural kind of stuff and Matthew's a little more uh, down to earth, but still believes that God can make God's self known um, when when need be. So it's the angel who validates Mary's story to Joseph and he as a result of that receives the same information and when he wakes up from the sleep he immediately takes Mary as his wife and has no marital relationships with her until she bears Jesus. Okay. So will you note please that there is no traveling to Bethlehem, that there is no um, mention of Caesar and the registration. There is no uh, political overpinning or historical rooting, grounding uh, for the Gentile audience. This was all expected. The Messiah would come, it would come out of, you know, out of Hebrew people, um, and there would, and this is how it would, would happen. So what we do get, though, is some political intrigue. It doesn't involve Caesar. It involves Caesar's puppet, King Herod, who was a Jewish king, um, who all he really, really wanted was to be received the title King of the Jews. Okay. He was King Herod. He ruled um, and when Jesus was born. It says he was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Okay. So later on in Matthew, there will be a comment that makes you think that they were living in Bethlehem. Um, that Nazareth comes into the story after they return from the escape to Egypt, um, and then they go, and they're trying to get away from Herod and his and his sons. So they go up to the Galilee and settle in Nazareth. So there's no traveling from Nazareth to Bethlehem. There is no room, you know, can't find the room in the inn. Can't, you know, got to go to a cave or a stable or whatever. So here's chapter two. Um, and here's where we get the wise men. No shepherds, no angels, no stable, no manger, okay? No travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem, no taxation, no registration. Angel, pregnancy, is, you know, an engagement, and then a baby is born. In the time of King Herod, this is chapter 2, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? And ooh, that would have rankled Herod right there. For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. 
Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Okay, so what did you notice? Did you notice that when they came, of course, wise men, rulers, seers, men of great wealth, and uh, with the kind of power to just say, oh, there's a new star, let's go follow it and see, you know, this is a sign in the heavens that someone important has been born. Let's just go on this journey and go follow it and see where it takes us. Um, so when they come to Jerusalem, they go to the court to, you know, kind of say, hey, we're here. We just want you to know this is what we're doing here. Don't freak out, you know. Uh, and yet Herod, because they said, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And that struck fear in Herod's heart. You would think as a Jew, he would have been keyed in on this idea of Messiah. And if there was this talk around town, that there had been a fulfillment of that, that he certainly would have known. Historians and travel people say that the journey from the east where they think that these magi came, uh, it could have taken up to two years. So Jesus would have been, uh, you know, a toddler at this point. They are living in a house, so not in a stable. So your manger scene is in, er in error. <laughs> um, but, the, you know, they come and they have gifts. And, of course, there are not necessarily three wise men, but there are three gifts. So we, we put them with wise men. And legend says that their names are Balthazar, Caspar, and I just lost the last one. Someone someone will come with it. Um, um, Melchior. So those three names have been affixed to these wise ones, these seers from the east who have come. Uh, so they come to the home. So here again, this is a, an indication that perhaps they were living in Bethlehem. They were at home, and they come to the house. They kneel down, and they open the gifts. And then, because they also had been warned in a dream, again, this kind of a supernatural event that warns them not to go back to Herod, uh, they leave for their own country by a different way. So... Um, they come, they see, and they, they go back. Notice that there is a star that's pretty important in Matthew's story. So we have all of creation being part of this, uh, of this narrative. And that star um, isn't even mentioned. The star of Bethlehem is not mentioned in Luke's story. So you know what happens then. Herod gets really mad, and he sends um, to, to kill all of the babies in Bethlehem to try to get rid of him, and they, the family escapes to Egypt. Um, again, to fulfill a prophecy of this, um, this great weeping that would happen around the birth of someone special, uh, that all these children were sacrificed, and then also that Jesus would be called out of Egypt uh, which obviously would be an echo for any Hebrew person to come out of Egypt would be to come out of slavery. And Jesus becomes the new Moses figure um, that's going to save the people, not only from slavery, but from their sinful natures. So, so think about this. Now we have the story from the perspective of the men. We are talking about Joseph. We are talking about Herod. We are talking about wise ones from the East who were probably not women. Um, you know, so this whole thing is done from the perspective of um, men and this political intrigue that goes on because of fear and greed and holding on to power. And um, and Mary's kind of there, and and Jesus is kind of there, but the story is really very little about him being born. 
the Matthew account is more about these wise ones who come from the East and how they fall into this political intrigue that gets uh, Jesus to go from Bethlehem to Egypt and eventually to settle in Nazareth. Um, so there you have it. You've got Matthew's story, which basically tells it from the boy's point of view, and Luke's story, which basically tells it from the girl's point of view. Um, we do like to put those two things together. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a use for all those little figures that came with our manger scene. Um, it is fun, though, if you've not done this before, is to set up your, uh, your wise men far away when you set up your manger scene and move them closer and closer. Uh, the 12 days of Christmas are marked as the full celebration, 12 days being a number of completion. So Christmas begins on Christmas Day, and, and we celebrate it for 12 days. I realize most of you take your stuff down even before Epiphany arrives, but Epiphany, January 6th, is the arrival of the wise men. The Eastern Orthodox churches, uh, the Ethiopian church where Pastor Antony uh, came up in the, in the Orthodox church there, um, they celebrate Christmas on January 6th at, with the arrival of the gift givers. Uh, and so the 12 days of Christmas is the culmination uh, of, I mean, Christmas celebration is, is marked on January the 6th, um, which is our the night before January 5th is 12th night. So January 6th is the day of Epiphany when the wise men are celebrated. So you would have 12 days to move your little wise men figures and your camels and whatever comes with them closer and closer and closer and then put them in the manger scene uh, on 12th night. And um, I'm looking, Peggy says, please check Gary Melcher's painting. Oh, yeah, that depicts Mary Joseph right after the birth of Jesus, another representation of a nativity scene. Yeah, that's the one where she's just exhausted and, and laying across, I believe, Joseph's lap holding on to Jesus. Yeah, that's a beautiful one. I think I've posted that before. So thanks for sharing that, Peggy. Google it. It's, it's a great one. So there you have it, um, two co really completely different stories that we put together and take little pieces from here and little pieces from there and stick them together. Um, my New Testament professor was a guy who said you need to understand the testimony and the witness of each individual gospel um, before you start, you know, before you start cherry picking the pieces that you want to put together. What was Mark trying to say? What was Matthew trying to say? What did Luke have to say, and to whom, and what does John have to say? And once you get some familiarity with those different authors and their audiences and how they approach their audiences, um, then you can get a, a, a widening idea of how these stories impact the rest of the narratives of the life, the teaching, the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus, who will be born in just a few hours. So... Thanks for being with me today. Um, next week, we will continue in Exodus. I know that will be kind of jarring to go throw back to um, coming out of slavery, but maybe I'll read the Matthew Escape to Egypt uh, and get us back into Egypt to get your brains back um, to Moses and Pharaoh and the people who are about ready to be let go uh, to journey to the promised land. It's all connected and it's all separate. So that's why we do it together. So Merry Christmas, y'all. I hope that uh, you'll be with us tonight for Hold an Evening Prayer at 7. And then tomorrow evening at 5 o'clock, we'll do the live stream of Christmas Eve. Um, when you get your email tomorrow morning, please pay attention to that because there will be a number of attachments. Uh, rather than because we're using so many carols or at least pieces of carols, both Christmas Eve and this coming Sunday, we didn't want to have to keep putting those slides up um, during worship. It gets kind of distracting when you have too many of them. So we have um, printed up a little a little attachment with the words of the hymns that we're going to use. Of course, if you have a hymnal at home, that would be the best way to do it. But um, So you're going to either need to print those out or have them available when you worship uh, Christmas Eve and on Sunday at 10. Um, Hopefully, being able to have the live stream available to you if you if you are eating or have something else going on at 5 o'clock, um, it will be there forever. So you can actually watch it, whatever is convenient for you. Anytime after 6, it will turn into a video. 
and uh, and you can watch it anytime you want, either on YouTube or on Facebook at Advent Olathe. Um, and we also, if you don't get that email for some reason, the website adventolathe.org has in one of the one of the pictures will say worship resources, and you poke on that, and then that'll give you um, the hymns, the the bulletin for Christmas Eve, and the bulletin for Sunday, and then this how to. Christmas Eve if you're not going to be able to watch if that family or something you want to have a little um, a little worship service without connecting to the virtual worship you've got the bare bones of your Christmas Eve candlelight service so blessings on your holiday I do hope that you connect yourselves with some worship event during these next couple of days uh, and that you you know that you feel the joy of the Christmas event uh, in a different way this year. We'll all, we're all going to feel it differently than we have before. So um, take this experience for what it is. And, um, and as Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are heavy, and care, or burden, you know, burdened and carrying heavy packs, and I will give you rest. Come, take my yoke upon you, and learn from me. So what will we learn this Christmas as we celebrate something that never changes? the fact that Christ our Lord has come. Merry Christmas, and I will see you all soon. Thanks for being with me today. Bye-bye.